to introduce myself. Um, and again, with um, talking about um, about Celtic coinage here, but um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges involved because um, actually the ancient British coins <coughs> is unique in the Celtic world because it is an up-to-date typology for an entire branch of Celtic coins, i.e. all Celtic coin types that we know of that were produced in, in Britain. But that is not the case for elsewhere in the Celtic world, and very much like um, for the other non-Roman coins that Andy was talking about, um, there is no standard typology across the Celtic world. Well, there is actually, but the only trouble was it's published in 1892. Um, it is still used today, still used widely today, because it quite simply is the only comprehensive uh, full coverage of the Celtic world, or reasonably comprehensive. So um, we are faced with very similar challenges to, to, to the challenges of the Greek world, is we've got the chicken and the egg situation. You know, what do you do first, the typology or, 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 um, or the online system? You try to do both things at once. So it's, um, it's tricky. But um, the Celtic stuff, okay, and we're, we're starting particularly, well, I'm going to be concentrating on Gaul here mainly. Um, we're starting to get um, advances from the Bibliothèque Nationale in France, who have, yeah, the most comprehensive collection. Um, it is actually the collection in Paris upon which Latour's work is based. And they're now starting to produce comprehensive catalogues of particular coinages within um, the Celtic world. Um, this is a point I'll come back to later. This volume is based on a tribal attribution of the coinage. This one is based on a typological attribution of the coinage. We're starting here already to see some of the complexities of how you deal with the Celtic world. Um, and for many coinages, we have the problem there are several parallel classifications with no um, direct concordance between these classifications, between these typologies. In one case, one French scholar has produced herself two conflicting typologies of the same group of coins. And also, typologies are necessarily subjective, and they don't reflect the realities of how Celtic coinages were produced. In the Celtic world, a lot of typologies are just our attempt to come to grips with the material we see. Um, so let, I mean, let's just have a look. Well, where are the problems with this? How do we reconcile, reconcile the different typologies for the, the Portin à Grosse-Tête? So uh, these are cast tin bronze coinages, um, Grosse-Tête, so with the big head. Um, here, Two examples, Michel Nick's typology on the left and Catherine Gruel and Anne Geiser's typology on the right. Um, um, none, of the, none of the examples on the left or the right are identical. There are similarities. Their class Bs are, are characterized by this beaded uh, diadem rather than just the straight band on the earlier ones. Um, uh, it, the, it, it's also based, to some extent, on the angle of the legs, on what looks very much like a kangaroo, but presumably isn't. Um, so it, it, it is not really possible to link these two through directly, and people are using both typologies when they are identifying coinages. How are we going to cope with this? And then there's the problem that some people are still using de la Tour, and also um, dealing with old excavation records, and the coins may not longer be accessible. Um, people are dealing with Gertur, and he only has eight different types. So how do I map these all, all together? Um, and so the question is really, it's like your parent and child problem, Andy, but we have to decide how far can we go down the family tree? Um, we have, I guess, the parent, and again, 
um, we have a conflict here because the Germans tend to call them the Plotins of the Sequani, a tribal attribution. The French, who generally prefer tribal attributions in this case, don't, but they like to call them the, the coins, the Plotins with the big head. So this is um, a problem we come back to. So we have the parents. Um, we can have the first generation, I suppose. We can just use A, B. Uh, Guel and Geyser only have A and B, but Nick runs down to E. It goes a long way. So how do you how do you cope with that? And then do we go down to A1, A2, and so on and so forth? So one of the one of the questions that we're going to have to look at, and I think we'll only be able to solve it as we move on, is how far down do we go in the family tree in the typology? Do we want to try, do we seriously want to try and link these classes together? Is it possible? I mean, with, with, with SCOS and with, with various ontologies, you can do these relationships, but is it starting to get so complicated that it's not really um, going to work? So this is one of the significant problems. And then, as I say, there's a problem of what do we even call these coins? And that is important when it actually comes to describing um, a coin in a typology. And again, Andy, you showed the list of the authority and everything like that and the mint and what have you, what you normally use to describe a coin. But again, this is, we immediately start to hit problems. Um, for example, who is the authority on Celtic coins? Can we actually talk about an authority? Um, we could use tribal names, but um, here, here's an example from, from De La Tour, the, the old catalogue, where we have the Tricori, the Sokovii, and Clanum, but then imitations of the coins of Marseille. Um, how, how are we going to get to grips with authority, for example, on, on these coinages? How are we going to deal with the concept of a mint in the Celtic world? Now, it's very nice with some of the British coins because it has, says Cam for Camulodunum, Colchester in East England. It's very useful, but the British always were rather different. And, that, um, and that's only because Cunabalinos also signs the coin. We even know who it is, we have the whole lot there. But for this coin of the Trevery, produced in the second, well, end of the second century BC, we have archeological evidence for the production of this coin at two sites, a hundred kilometers apart. So what do, do I do with mint in the Celtic world? Um, we sometimes have mints, we have physical evidence for the production of coins, but we also know that a lot of coins seem to have been produced by traveling um, craftsmen. There is a hoard of dyes of Celtic coins discovered in southern Germany um, and some, uh, with various dyes, several hundred kilometers or yeah, maybe a hundred kilometers distant from the site where we assume these coins are being produced, for example. And the dyes don't all belong to coins we feel are produced at one center. So we're running into, into, into big problems here. And then how do we deal with the legends on Celtic coins? Um, again, uh, another British example, Tincomius um, Comii Filius. We know exactly who this person was. He's in the historical record. That's easy. But then I have a whole series of coins from Gaul where Q, Doki, Sam, F, um, we have no idea who this person was. And in some cases, we don't even know if the legend on the coin actually refers to a person who was um, striking the coin. So at what point does the legend become the authority or is it just something you record on the coin? So Celtic coins really do um, uh, bring up some problems. Um, how to do it? I mean, this is Peri Power Ribe's um, uh, way of really of dealing with the Greek world. Um, how to eat an elephant, and the answer is one bite at a time. So this is just going to be moving on slowly and learning as we, as we go along. I think we'll be able to learn a lot from online Greek coinage. Um, but but um, yes, 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 yes. But we do have a few other challenges as well. Um, so the question really is here, and this again is, I'm afraid, another presentation without a conclusion. Um, 
is how do we eat the elephant? Well, we're starting now, and we're, we're really we're just going to go straight back to the beginning, and we're going to turn Latour, even if he is 125 years old, um, uh, into a a linked open data typology as a starting point because it is something being used by a lot of people and then we can start um, to move into that um, and uh, again we will set up a central framework for this um, I've analogous then to, to, to GreekCoinage.org I um, don't go on the website it just says under construction um, but at least we have we do actually have a website where we can start to pull this all um, together and then once we've got that that'll uh, that I guess is our skeleton in, in a way um, once we've got that there then we will start to look at individual re regions and coinages for which there are satisfactory typologies and which we can already then incorporate into Namisma the vocabulary and and so for example the Averni and the money Alacroix which we started off uh, with at the beginning uh, and then we will have to work out how to incorporate coinages for which there is not yet a typology or for which there are conflicting typologies. How are we um, going to cope with that? So um, it's, yeah, again, very much work in progress, but um, interesting, interesting challenges when you start to move into the world of, uh, of, of linked open data where it is extremely fuzzy. And how can you join together these fuzzy things? And Celtic typologies, of, the typologies of Celtic coinages are extremely subjective. Really, in many cases, it's just a long flow of development, maybe over 100 years, and people have cut it up into segments in order to be able to deal with it. How do you cope with that? How do you cope with this sort of thing? Um, so it's, a lot of it's going to be getting machines to work the way humans think, I guess. So thank you very much for that.